Hey everyone, welcome to Taking the Pulse, a healthcare and life sciences video podcast. I am Heather Hoops Matthews in the studio today in South Carolina, joined by a Maynard Nexon healthcare attorney, Lauren DeMoss in Alabama. Lauren, it's great to be with you. Thanks so much, Heather. It's great to be here today. And we are fortunate to have back on the East Coast from a whirlwind trip joining us, David Stefanich. He is CEO and co-founder of Remedy, a tech company helping labs modernize the clinical diagnostic experience. David has also been chair of SC Bio, the South Carolina's booming life sciences group. They have just returned from San Diego. Uh, David, welcome back to The Pulse. Glad to be here. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. For anyone who doesn't know it, in 2024, early 2024, SC Bio presented Remedy with the South Carolina Pinnacle Award for organizational contribution, everything that the company has done for the industry. Congratulations on that, David, and start us off by giving us an overview for our viewers and listeners of what you do and specifically the latest in Kenya and Mongolia. No, I'd be happy to. So yes, over the last several years, uh, Remedy has been working with life science companies focused around creating world-class blockchain-based technology and for healthcare and population management uh, globally. I mean, our overall mission has been able, is to enable life science companies and organizations to you know improve health outcomes, to overall improve wellness and market, and just look for that innovative way to bring established healthcare from one market to a, to another market. Um, and, and on top of that, one of the things that just launched and it just hit the wire, I'm super excited to share it, is that one of our clients, Biospy, has just launched a prostate screening uh, platform across the Commonwealth of the Bahamas so that these remote islands can get quality health care and identification because prostate cancer is one of the most curable forms of cancer as long as you catch it early. And to know that the Remedy team was on the ground in market uh, on a little place called Cat Island, uh, which is known for fishing, but now it has a prostate screening facility for all the uh, folks in that region. And it's super exciting when we see things like that occur and be out in the trenches and see in the faces of the lives we impact. Yeah, that's that's impactful in, in, in hard to reach places. Beautiful, but hard to reach. Absolutely. Yeah. That's very cool, David. You know, bringing it back, I guess, stateside a little bit, um, life sciences generates an estimated $26 billion annually in South Carolina. And it's my understanding that industry is growing faster in South Carolina than any other southeastern state. And, and given that growth and kind of demand, obviously, that requires a very capable workforce. Mm -hmm. So in your view, how is South Carolina positioned regarding talent and, and the ability to support life science industries and, and companies like you all? Yeah, actually, today I'm actually at the Ar uh, Arthrex facility down in, in Florida uh, with uh, Jim Clemens from uh, Clemson University and his leadership staff with leaders from Flora, BMW, um, ExxonMobil. Um, and we're actually talking about how to engage and continue to expand the life science program. Um, we have really uh, Dr. Uh, Cynthia Young, who uh, Remedy helped work on the Precision Medicine Initiative, which just went through phase one and is up for an NIH grant to go scale to about uh, 100,000 individuals for giving full genomic background, we always talk about how to bring South Carolina talent within South Carolina and attract it from the state inside. Um, and, you know, as the governor has stated multiple times, you know, we focus on manufacturing workforce development, and they've added a third tenant called digital health, which uh, I'm very fond of, to say the least. But we're looking and working closely from an SC Bio position to work with the universities, work the collaboration between MUSC, USC, and Clemson to cross-pollinate programs, not just single degrees, but advanced degrees that support our industry, develop talent in-state, and continue to grab the opportunity of in-state investment and growth that's happening across our entire state. I've heard that Remedy um, has a solution for mm -hmm. workforce needs by using mm -hmm. international professionals. And we've mm -hmm. had lawyers, immigration lawyers on in the past in this podcast talk about how challenging it can be at times mm -hmm. to get the right visas and get them mm -hmm. quickly enough. Uh, why have you chosen this route? And then how do you make it work? No, no, great, great question. It was probably about 18, 24 months ago when we, we all heard in the news, Facebook, Twitter, others were laying off all these individuals that were on H-1B visas. And I started digging in deep into that market to figure out what are the real challenges? What, is, what do people say versus what's really happening in market? And I was able to work with a local firm called BDV, 
um, that Brit founded and just did some private equity work. And it was started to investigate other options. So the other options were graduate students coming out of an academic institution can work on a CPT visa. So it isn't cost prohibitive and overhead prohibitive, but I was able to go out to Clemson University as well as USC and work closely with their academic advisors so as individuals, as they achieve their advanced degrees, they can have opportunities right here in the upstate. Um, in conjunction with that, we actually have uh, a gentleman working with us who is a refugee from a, a situation happening in Eastern Europe. And we work closely with the legislation to figure out how to not just give him employment here, but also have his family. So we have two different people that have been displaced from their countries working with us. We have people that have come to the U.S. to get an education. They want to stay in the U.S. Early stage companies, we don't always have the ability to go process through the green card process and all those things. But I commit to them as we as a firm continue to grow, help me understand how best in class talent can be brought to the upstate through colleagues, relationships, mentoring programs and other things at the universities and allow companies that are still early stage to benefit from these aspects that are going on. It's always about innovation. Innovation is just a little sister of a challenge and you have to go figure out how to bring best in class. And uh, that's what we strive for. I like that, David. Innovation is a little sister of a challenge. When you think about some of these international workers, are, are you finding there certain roles within Remedy that they fit best in, in terms of placement and, and kind of, or is it really more background specific? And then I guess as a follow-up to that, when you think about placement of international workers, are there are there best practices you'd recommend for, for companies looking to do kind of what you all have done there? Well, it, it, it really reflects on the DNA of what Remedy is. And we we do things around the world, but I will tell you, everywhere we work, um, I can walk into uh, Benoni, South Africa, and walk in and say some bonu and jali. I can walk into uh, somewhere in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, and say sabano. Um, everyone at Remedy is a global citizen in their approach of how we do things. We understand the cultural aspects of wellness, along with the medical delivery and the, and the traditional healthcare. There's this Maslow's hierarchy of what wellness defines, and I think cultural aspects. So everyone that works at Remedy, we encourage them to be multilingual. We listen to diversity going on in our organization culturally. Um, you know, inequities in healthcare is a, is a global situation. Every market has their own flavor, but it's the mindset you bring to that market that we encourage inside of Remedy. So uh, individuals that are coming on board, they may be uh, engineers, they may be familiar with health policies in that region. Um, they may understand how to go deliver things in certain markets. There's cultural aspects uh, everywhere. And just by accidentally stepping on a, a cultural norm that we think is common in the U.S. that may not be applicable there, um, is, it could be a barrier to some of the simplicity as, as seeing that. And um, one of my favorite my favorite memories is a, is a little girl's face we saw when we were in uh, Mongolia and we were working with her parents. And, uh, you know, I'm a dad of four. Yeah, right? And there's that universal look of, what are you doing? You know, are we going to be okay? And I don't speak very fluent Mongolian, but I was able to speak a little kid. And uh, those child's faces uh, happened from that mindset. And uh, I see international students, we're very appreciative of their opportunities they have in market. Um, we think about the family. We think about all the aspects of, you know, we might have 34 employees, but we impact 82 lives. And as a founder, it's important that I remember those 82 lives. It isn't just 34 employees. And it's, it's the cultural DNA of, of being who we are and what we do and why we do it. So that's what we look for. Yeah. Well, it's clear you enjoy your job. You enjoy the industry. You got like just contagious passion. What do you think communities need to do, regardless of what state we're in, mm -hmm. to attract more people to the life sciences industry? It seems to just be growing so swiftly and we just hear these workforce needs across industries. Well, you know, I have four daughters and two just graduated from uh, college and, and one's a, um, a software engineer and the other one is uh, creative writing with mathematics and, and computer science and marketing as their minors. And, and they were been able to see what is going on. Um, you know, you could have a job or a career, but you could have a life passion and, and, and you're right on point with that, where that enjoyment of, you know, a long time ago, we learned you don't get it till you give it away. And I think there's an aspect in the life science industry of curiosity. I think there's an aspect of excitement. There's an aspect of discovery. If you approach it as you've got to take chemistry and math and it's going to be hard, that doesn't attract anyone. But if you can get to that intangible, that, that je ne sais quoi, that has you wake up in the morning at three o'clock because you have a call in Europe 
and that night you have a call in Asia at nine, it's not about work-life balance. It makes it sound like, you know, work, bad, life, good. It's passion, who you are and what you do. So when we speak to, uh, you know, early STEM programs over in, even in some of the magnet schools, things we can do at, at Greenville uh, School System, anywhere that we can share those aspects of what it is to have a life passion versus this is a challenging discipline. There's always ways to inspire. And, uh, you know, the best way to do that is even with your children. It's by example. You know, I, will, I tell everybody uh, what we do is for the light of heart and it will never be boring. And uh, if you want to wake up every day and think what the challenge is going to be today and how can I solve it in a way that doesn't just affect me, but affects others and it ripples in a pond, maybe that's something you want to go explore. Yeah. Creating a passion for sure. That's that's so beyond kind of workforce needs. And and it sounds like you're doing a phenomenal job from an engagement perspective. What do you see as kind of the biggest challenge and or the biggest opportunity facing the life sciences industry? You know, for South Carolina, the, my, my my biggest amazement is lack of visibility to what's going on in South Carolina. Um, you know, we started our company in Raleigh. We decided to move it down because of the ecosystem, because of what was going on. And I always joke when they're like, oh, what's your market? I'm like, it's south of D.C., east of New Mexico. They call it the south, and we should be center of excellence for that region. Um, you know, our colleagues we work with with MassBio, you know, they're amazing when you're looking at device development. Um, when you're in Raleigh, therapeutics. There is no reason South Carolina isn't the center of excellence for digital health, not just in our country, but around the globe. And it's that visibility. So James Chappell is the CEO of SE Bio, along with myself as chairman. You know, we're continually working closely with Ohio Bio, Mass Bio, bio organizations that are thinking about, I can do the same thing I've been doing for 25 years, but there's got to be something better. Um, I had some incredible conversations with uh, Tulane University, now I was at SC Bio. Remedy, we do population help and delivery like we're doing with BioSpy, but we also handle clinical trials and the research backbone for Clemson University and, and other schools. And cross-discipline research development, IP protection, those things happen in a lot of places. And they're like, oh, you do that in South Carolina? And, you know, the leadership team at, at Clemson and others have been really forthcoming because South Carolina is always looking for collaboration opportunities on the academic as well as the industrial side. And when you're up in uh, at the Capitol speaking with, you know, Tim Scott's team or Lindsay's team, and they're like, oh, that's the federal dollars coming down to the state and working closely with the leadership and lieutenant governor and so forth here in the state, how that trickles through. So it's a visibility challenge. Um, you know, it, it's when we, we sit with the economic development folks and I'm always hearing about you know, the tourism economy and what a great place to be. I'm like, that's one facet of a finely polished gem called Greenville, South Carolina for us. And the more I keep learning about Charleston and, and the Midlands, it's the same way. So take that one facet. It's a great place to live. Wonderful. However, you have the opportunities for the world-class education. You have the opportunities for an amazing, passionate career. You have the opportunities to reach out from where we live and make impacts around the world. And uh, personally, I love grabbing the Dabo Sweeney line where I'm just like, hey, I'm just that little tech company above the dentist office on Main Street. And mm -hmm. they're like, what lives are you impact impacting? And I'm like, everywhere. And that's just who we are and how we do it. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I, th I think uh, if you're like me, you're probably like, wow, where is this going to go for remedy? You, you speak, you know, as humbly about it, but you are making a great impact. As we uh, begin to wrap up, give us a vision uh, for the next few years and the impact that you'll make. You know, it, it, it's interesting. We have that discussion all the time. Um, we, you know, we just we just finished our Series A in uh, last fall, and we had some opportunities to to become that center of excellence and make impacts. And you know, we we look at opportunities across our state. We're always looking for opportunities across our country. And most importantly, how do we reach outside of ourselves and, and be what we want to be? Um, when we formed the company, uh, what, six years ago in August, we wrote down 12 axioms of who we wanted to be. And we always want to remember the DNA. Of, you know, we never put a dollar before a life. You know, it's just who we are. For us, no topic is sacrosanct. So we'll look at every opportunity that's out there and maximize not always the benefit for the firm, but for the benefit of an alignment with the mission and thinking about those individuals that are out there. So at this point, we we have not um, 
turn down anything related to an opportunity. Um, we have a pretty exciting partnership with a company called MedAditus, um, which is a continuous flow pharmaceutical company in Kisumu, Kenya, that's actually going to go continuous flow for a product called Neverapine, that if you give it to a child right after birth, HIV does not get transferred from mother to the child. And wow. we're, at the, we're wow. at the grassroots of how to identify the parent that has HIV, making sure that the detection is there, the treatment is there, and then how we can look at that impact across that entire region to ensure we're helping to limit the spread of HIV through birth. So that's an exciting project that, we, that we're working on diligently right, right now. And there's also some national research programs um, that we want to be able to leverage the collaboration. Um, during COVID, there was an amazing project called Warp Speed, and people were collaborating in a way. And because of our blockchain back end, we have that ability to share between entities while protecting IP, while protecting rights for monetization and sharing. And it's great because Manor Next has been helping us with all the patents. But how do we take that mindset and like-minded individuals and say, we had a pandemic, what did we, what's, there, there are positive takeaways from that, the ability to collaborate uh, and share information. And when you can tie in the diagnostics, the clinical trials, the therapeutic and the delivery of that therapeutic to market, going back to the mission, uh, that's, that's what we're looking to do over these next few, uh, next few years to continue to build and figure out, you know, the opportunity of innovation is just lurking around the corner and it's, it's a, our responsibility to go peak. Well, I, I have no doubt that you will there, be there and willingly being step, step up to help. Uh, for everybody on behalf of The Pulse today, thank you so much for David Stefanich joining us while you're traveling. We are grateful, also grateful mm -hmm. for your work, whether it's on Cat Island or in Mongolia or right here in Greenville, South Carolina. Thank you so much for joining us today. Real pleasure being here. Thank you so much. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Taking the Pulse. We look forward to seeing you next time right here, Taking the Pulse, a healthcare and life sciences video podcast. <music>